the reason why I was talking about why we have to, why I have sympathy for the white working class male is because like they have been scapegoated as, you know, the source of all evil in society. And I mean, he, okay, okay, I, I, I can go with you there. But the problem with that, I can go with you, I, I, can, I can walk with you to that pier. Right. The problem is I can't walk to you to that peer if the person who is making that argument is the Democratic Party. Like, hmm. like, like we can like we can we can talk about like the, the patriarchy, the you know the psi hetero patri- You know what? Screw it. We can talk about honkies all day. Like, we can talk about honkies all day. <laughs> but, but I don't want to hear that from the Democratic Party establishment. Right, because as neoliberals, they are I- I deeply entrenched in white supremacy, and so my they're perpetuating the systems. Yeah, like so. Yes, exactly. they're perpetuating, yeah, they're perpetuating the systems. Like, 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 they are perpetuating the system that gave us neo-nationalism, neo-fascism globally. We will touch on that, but I wouldn't say this briefly about about. And so, like, yes, I feel perfectly, you know, fine criticizing white males, but not when it's the Democratic Party who's labbing that critique from a political, from a political, and, and so again. It's also short-sighted. I mean, if you're going to lob that from the Democratic Party with the hypocrisy that's evident, then you're just – it's short-sighted. It, it's short-sighted, but, and this is – I was going to say from political, from a strategic standpoint politically, but my point – but and this is goes back to my how I've been kind of back and forth about whether it, whether the media and Democrats do this on purpose or if this is just like a subconscious cognitive dissonance thing. And it's really both. And so, like, they, they don't only point to the white working class male as – a strategic foil to them to make themselves more attractive to females, blacks, people, you know, to, uh, LGBT people. They also do it because this is what they want to believe about their own party, right? Like, this is like, that's what they want to believe to be true about themselves. So when people talk about, like, you know, when the Daily Co's in Mark, Marcos, whatever his name is, oh, like, God. Like, with that dick bag, I mean, yeah, that dick bag. When he goes up there and says, like, oh my God, coal miners are gonna lose their health care. I hope they like I hope they like having black lung and dying. They shouldn't have voted for Republicans. It's just like, dude, it's just like not like, like that kind of homogenizing of the working class as being both white and male does not help anybody. And again, it it, it helps treat any kind of policy that is broad, any kind of broad economic policy, like basic basic minimum wage, or basic universal wage. I'm sorry, universal basic income or yeah. minimum wage increase as a white vanity project that would only benefit white males. And it also allows the Democratic Party, as Adair said so eloquently before, to, uh, you know, put salve on their own racism, hide their own racism like, in the guise of, well, if I were to, by making racism not something that you perform or do, but something that you are. It's like, like, like yeah. you're not like, like, you're like you do you do do racism. You're not a like, you're not a racist. <laughs> I, mean, you can be racist. I just the basic income thing. I thought it was just particularly interesting because uh, when Bernie was going around the country in, during his campaign, you mentioned often the black youth unemployment. It's like if you start paying people just because they're citizens of the country, and fifty percent of youth black youth are unemployed. That's going to be a huge boon to black youth. That's a lot of money in the pocket of black youth, like just just point blank. Like so, to paint it as a as a you, white vanity project is just so uh, seen. It, it, it's I can't even believe that. You can't, you can't, but you can't tell them that. You can't tell them that the majority of union members are people of color and women. You know, you can't tell them that the majority of people who earn a minimum wage or or or, 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 or servers wage are women or people of color because that's like because that's not part of their metric. And so and that, gets, that gets a lot of policies, though. I mean, you look at the education policy. What was Clinton's uh, objection to the edu- uh, Bernie's education policy was that Trump's kids would get to go to college for free, too. And so it's not, it, they don't use it just as race. They use every aspect of creating these micro identities that they then turn into a weaponized thing. So you're like, okay, we're going to make something universal. We're going to make it apply to everyone. It's going to be egalitarian and everyone's going to benefit. Well, these people might as well, so we can't have that. Well, I mean, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's but that's like that's the that's the part of liberal theology, right? Liberals love yeah. big liberal, like liberals love that sort of weird technocratic expertise, like lots of math. Now, I know I'm going to sound anti science with Like liberals, I'm moving for like I point out because I want to answer the because if I let Brandon go, we'll be here all night and no one else will get to speak. So I'm going to talk about this right yeah. now because what we had been talking about before we go forward, Brandon is about you know that whole demonization of the white uh the white working class yes there are white working class members that are absolutely horrible and yes throughout history that has been a large you know has been a fair representation of a large portion of them but let's again dig to the problem and i think that's the issue that a lot of times liberals conflate 
is they can inflate class issues solely as ethnic issues, as race issues, when the fact of the matter is this all, again, stems from capitalism. This stems from times in slavery when poor white folks would just be like, I have no more social standing than these black slaves and would go and hang out with them. So there had to be a system created in order to keep poor people in line. And so that is one of the major fallacies that liberalism presents today is that it's more about race than it is about class. Yes, race is an issue. Racists are a problem. Beat every single Nazi you see. Not no, Nazis. We're, no, we're, not, we're, we're not going to get back on this right, right now. Minutes, Maybe in a few minutes. Two fronts. <laughs> you have to do it on two fronts. You have to, you have to act sometimes, quite literally, fight racists, but you also have to fight the conditions that create racism. You have to fight the, creation, the, the conditions that allow for Fox News and the Republicans to propagate racism and to make more and more and more of them. You have to go in and pull the, root, the weed up from the roots instead of just mowing the lawn. Well, that, that's the interesting thing you were just saying about Fox News. I mean, let's say that it, Fox News obviously weaponizes race as well, but they weaponize it from the opposite direction. They, they're using it to say, like, the, the immigrants are stealing your job, or black people are getting special treatment that you don't need, like Obama phones and things along those lines. So it, it's both parties are doing it, but they're just weaponizing it from a different direction. Well, so here's the thing about that, right? So... Uh, yeah, both parties have weaponized race. That's race. absolutely, as, as we or re weaponized identity. Like, I, every, yes. both parties have weaponized identity, everything, everything including class, right? And everything including class. And this is why I was bringing up the fact that we have to be, that we have to embrace the white working class, not because I, you know, care about white people. Ha ha ha. Of course, ne never that. Never that. No. Um, <laughs> never, never that. But because, like, they're used as a scapegoat to prevent the Democratic yes. Party from having to engage with its own major flaws internally, its own racism, its own classism, its own all of these things. That's why I said, you know, they are able to pre present class issues by nature of, of presenting the white working class as this homogenized thing, both racially and racially and gender gender wise as um, as um, as uh, a white vanity project, a male vanity project. You have people like Kamani Gandhi coming out, or Joy and Reed. It doesn't make a difference. Don't care uh, about either of them. Um, coming on TV, I, that's rude. Whatever. I know. I, I meant it. I meant it. <laughs> um, uh, coming on TV and going based. I'm going with Twitter and going. Hey, you know what? I wish that the first thing I thought of, you know, when I woke up was the of what was with Wall Street corruption. It must be nice to be white. It's like, what's like, what do you think when you first like, what you sing and chant the rapper songs? <laughs> <laughs> Rain drop. You start humming "Who Shot You" by Biggie Small. What kind of racist noise is that? But my point is this: it's like, yeah, but in embrace, but the the left, the the right has weaponized, has weaponized identity, right? But. It's through the weaponization that the left engages in. It's through that that sort of erasure of class by nature of neoliberal identity politics that they have empowered the right's weaponization of identity politics. By that I mean this: when you use race and identity to essentially make every conversation against your party's platform, including ones that are it's including arguments that are based in, hey, your party's corporatist, it's classist, it's elitist. You have no interest in taking out Wall Street. You have no interest in giving anyone universal, making health care a universal right, not health, not guaranteeing health insurance. Like when you when you frame all of those things, when you frame any critique of the capitalist system as some kind as like inherently racist or an inherently white vanity project, the problem with that is that you empower neo-nationalists, you empower the far right who has also weaponized identity politics because what that does is they're able to use identity as, uh, as sorry, they're, 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 they are able to identify identity, whether it be immigrants or black people or women, as the cause of the, or, as the, cause of the problems that are going unaddressed by your party, right? So, so, so what led to the rise of neo-nationalism globally is the neoliberal liberal takeover of the left because what that did was it made it left no viable room on the left for engaging with a class analysis in good faith engaging with with anti-capitalism in good faith engaging with a, a more intersectional approach to you know socialist feminism uh Mar black marxism any of these things that traditionally exist on the left they were deemed not valid leftist positions and so 
So basically, they're the they're, policies were shut down. Yeah, the policies were shut down on the basis of they were for whatever reason. So like, but what that does is that. So basically, the only people who are allowed within the political system at the you know general level are people like Trump, because if the if the liberals on the left, the neoliberals on the left, quash any class analysis, quash any capitalist critique from like before it even gets into the general population, by like, internally, and the right does not do that. And their class critique is steeped in racism and neo-nationalism, neo-fascism. Well, here's the thing: they're the only one presenting a critique of the system. And yes. so, and so, while lib- what, so what liberals basically say is they go, "Hey, you know what? You can have a critique of the capitalist system, but it's going to be racist. <laughs> it's going to be racist, and you don't want to be a racist, do you?" And some people are going to go, "Like, listen, hey, you know what? If only one party is identifying the problem, either I'm going to vote for that party, or I'm not going to vote at all." Because and so and I, and I say this, like this whole thing boils down perfectly with the the, dis, the discrepancy between the make America I always say the make America great was the best racist slogan ever that speaks so str- if you've ever been in rural America and in, in Rust Belt America the idea of nostalgia for the once the bygone days of manufacturing that are never coming back Sorry. which is exactly why bill clinton <laughs> kicked off his campaign with that with that slogan like, that's exactly why bill clinton like, used yeah, that make, slogan back when he ran make america great was the perfect slogan it was stupid because like it cause it was harkening back to a past that never existed a racist past but you know what but, but it, it was at least saying hey i've identified a problem with the system people are poor people yep. are struggling i identified this problem my solution is that we get rid of the brown people so but whatever i've identified the problem the Democrats didn't identify a problem. Their their slogan was "Make America great." Make America's already great. There is no yeah. problem. Everything's just fine. So as stupid and racist as the as "Make America Great" was, you know, implicitly racist, uh, at least identified a problem. "Make America Great." America's already great. That's just disrespectful. <laughs> that's yeah. like, that's like, America's that's already great and love Trump's people. hate. Like those two, like just yeah. terrible, let me, terrible let me slogans. Let me, tell you, let me tell you something, fam. Let me tell you something, fam. As, as someone who grew up poor and someone who's poor now. If you tell me my life is fine and I can look around and, and my material conditions do not reflect that, that pisses me off. 